Thank you. What a beautiful song and what a wonderful church family. Honored to be a small extension of Pastor Smith's desire to be a blessing to pastors. And I'm glad to see you today. Thank you for coming. And uh, just coming to this meeting, I had the joy to come here years ago as a pastor on the West Coast where it's wild and woolly out here, right? <laughs> and uh, I had the joy to come up and spend the, uh, the pastor's delight with you and was so helped at uh, my visit then. And, and every year that you have it, I think I can honestly say I've prayed for the meeting, even though I have not been here in person. But to be a pinch hitter tonight for Brother David Gibbs is a great honor and a blessing. And uh, I think about men who have helped our nation, helped God's people. I don't know how you could um, describe with words. I speak for a living. I don't think I have the words to describe what I feel for Brother David Gibbs. And um, I know he's watching tonight, I'm sure. And he wants to be here. He loves coming here. He loves being anywhere where God wants him to be. But I'm honored to be with you as, as uh, kind of a substitute. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Brother Smith, to come. And we're very grateful for that. And then to preach with uh, Dr. Paul Chapel. I, um, I was a school teacher for 11 years and, and uh, had taught school for, from 1989 until uh, 2000. It was April the 18th in 2000. I was grading my high school English papers and, uh, for the 11th and 12th grade class. And I got a call that someone needed a pastor. And uh, it was a deacon of a church in Long Beach, California. I knew the church. I worked there uh, seven years prior to that, and I uh, loved the church, and it didn't, I didn't know they were asking me to be a pastor. I thought they would just, you know, I said, man, we're praying that God will give you a pastor. I said, we're looking for one, too, and that's why we called you. I said, well, wonderful. I've got a couple suggestions for you. I gave him a couple names. I said, we don't want your suggestion, we want you, and uh, at that time, I was 32 years old. I had preached um, in, a, in a public service uh, seven times in my life at that point. And three of the times I was so nervous I got sick and threw up. The other four times the audience got sick and threw up. I think. And uh, I was off my rug. I couldn't even imagine pastoring a church. And I thought, it's just, this is not going to be my life. I can't imagine that. But uh, the Lord, uh, that was April the 18th and May 7th. I was chosen to be a pastor. And June the 9th, I moved to Long Beach, California and assumed the opportunity to pastor the beautiful people of the First Baptist Church of Long Beach. And uh, without uh, any reservation, one of my sweetest friends and mentors and help was Dr. Paul Chapel. He loved us, he helped us. Uh, if it was not the first Thanksgiving, it was the second Thanksgiving that our whole family came up and spent time with him for Thanksgiving. And anything he could do to be an encouragement to me, he, he did that and some. And then in 2008, when our son went home to be with Jesus unexpectedly, uh, so many folks from the West Coast loved us, but um, they were in the middle of a staff orientation. He shut down the whole orientation and brought everybody who wanted to come, could come to the service. And it was just an amazing support and encouragement. And I love him, and I'm looking forward to hearing him speak tonight. And I, I wanted to be a blessing this evening. If you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter number 1, if you would please. James chapter number 1. It's a great joy to be here, and I'm certainly grateful for those who are putting the work in on the, on the West Coast, especially have a great, a great love for this region of the country, the Pacific Northwest, and even though I found out that I wasn't supposed to fly southwest, <laughs> uh, I, it does pretty good other places, and it did fine today, so I'm just glad we got here, and I'm glad I didn't check my luggage. I carried it on, so it worked out good. It came with me, so that's great. But I'm so glad to be with you tonight, and thank you very much. I don't want to preach long. I heard about one guy who said, I've got so much to say, I don't know where to start. And a little kid in the back says, start somewhere toward the end. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that you've heard messages like that, and you're probably saying the same thing with that little kid tonight. Uh, come on, get in, speak up, shut up, sit down, and uh, let somebody else uh, take over here. But I'm really glad to be able to share this time with you. Let's stand together if we can, please. James chapter 1. If you'll follow along, we'll read some verses together. But follow along if you would, please. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ of the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this is the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. 
Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because of the flower of the grass he passed away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Would you read verse 12 with me? Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried... Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Would you read verse 17 with me? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of of his own will he beget us with the word of truth, and we should be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my, be my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, so to speak, so to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves." Would you read verse 23 and 24 together with me, please? For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty continueth therein, and he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any of you among you seem to be religious, then bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. And let's conclude in verse 27, please. Pure religion. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Word of God. I'm glad that you didn't leave us in this world without a road map. It's very clear. You give us everything we need to know in precepts and in principle. You help us know you left no stone unturned. And I'm so glad for that. I'm glad we have the Spirit of God. I'm glad we have the church of Jesus Christ that uh, is the pillar and ground of truth. I thank God for pastors. So grateful for the men of God who are here. I just uh, have a great love for pastors. Long before I ever became one, I, uh, I treasured the joy of having a shepherd in the flock that would take heed to himself and then over the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made him an overseer. And I've been so benefited by men of God. I pray you please help us. As we spend a few hours together today and tomorrow, I pray that you would anoint the time. I do pray for those who are listening to Brother um, Duran and Brother Torres over in the Spanish. And then, of course, uh, Brother Duffett and Brother Larry Chapel speaking for the teens. I pray you'd speak to their hearts, and I pray you'd sanctify the time we have together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. I remember years ago hearing Clarence Sexton say there's just two positions open in Christianity. One is to pastor a local Bible-believing church for God. The other is to help that pastor pastor that church for God. And that's where everybody is. That's where we are. We either pastor or we help our pastor. And I'm forever thankful for pastors. I've always loved pastors. And, and uh, I had the joy to grow up in a home where my dad, uh, my dad and my mom, they raised us in a Christian home. But my dad did not have that opportunity. He was a first generation Christian. His mother was an alcoholic and would eventually die with cirrhosis of the liver. His mom and dad had a dysfunctional relationship and thus his home was that way. I'm so, I'm so thankful. I don't know what church it was. I don't even know what the pastor's name was. But the pastor talked to an older man in the church. He said, we need someone to teach junior age boys. I'm going to give you this room. Would you take it? That man took the room. He was a little man, according to my uncle. Small fella. But he wasn't content to have one or two or three people in the Sunday school class. He would spend his days and sometimes his evenings scouring the streets of Knoxville, Tennessee, trying to find junior age boys and invite them to come to his class. And every week he would do his best to teach the Bible, and then he would send them all to big church, except for one of those boys. He would pray and tap one of them on the shoulder and say, why don't you stay after? I'd like to talk to you. And he put a folding chair in the corner, according to my uncle, and then turned another folding chair facing that. He sat in the corner, and 
One day he tapped my dad, Richard Lynn Wilkerson, on the shoulder and said, Rich, I'd like to talk to you. Would you be willing to stay after while the other guys go to big church? My dad was 11 years old. He said, yes. And he sat there in that chair and that teacher took the Bible and showed him how to be saved. Amen. And a few minutes later, he asked the Lord Jesus to save him. Went to big church, saved and excited. Told his little brother Douglas, I'm saved, I'm saved. He said, well, good, that's fine. He goes, hey, man, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. He goes, well, good, good, Richard, I'm glad you're, you're saved. He went home and found his mother who was intoxicated and told her, Mama, I'm saved. He said, you can't be saved. You've got to be 12 to be saved. The Bible, everybody knows that, tells it. You have to be 12 to be saved. He said, no, Mama, I'm saved. Boy, he aggravated his brother so much and pestered his brother all week. He, he, his brother said, tell the teacher to tap me on the shoulder this week. <laughs> and the teacher did. He went up and told the teacher, said, can you talk to my brother Doug? And he set him in the corner the next week and my uncle Doug got saved. Of course, that changed my eternal destiny to some extent. I, obviously, my dad being saved didn't get me saved, but he exposed me to the word of God. I'm so glad he met my beautiful mom, and they have six children. I'm the oldest of those six kids. My name is John. I have three brothers. They're all pastors, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that's not a joke. That's true. I have two sisters, and their names are not Acts and Romans. <laughs> their names are Jan and Mary. But all of that, uh, my dad had happy feet, so we kind of moved around a lot. But... Uh, I had good pastors. Everywhere we moved, eight different states, 17 different times from the time I was born to I graduated from high school. But one thing that was a common for me is my dad found a local church with a Bible-believing pastor. And all those pastors, some of them were older, some of them were younger. Some of them were gifted preachers. Some of them were men who just plowed through the scriptures faithfully. Not very entertaining, but faithful to the Word of God. People who went soul winning, who provided camps and bus routes and Sunday school classes and vacation Bible schools and youth conferences and trips to camp and all the things that I didn't know. You know, I just got on the bus and was glad to be there. I didn't know that bus needed fuel. <laughs> didn't know it needed insurance. I didn't know there were all the challenges it would be with that. I just, I was a taker, 100%. But I had a pastor who was burdened and prayed and loved the Lord, and I am so grateful for pastors. And I'm very grateful for the men of God who are here. Thank you for what you do for Jesus. And thank you for being faithful in your place. And I know pastors struggle, I struggle with inadequacies. Thinking, man, if I could just get my act together, this church would go someplace. Feel inadequate. Sometimes it's just satanic opposition that aggravates you. It just seems like it just, it just comes in the most unopportune times to just to, to pester uh, bullies and critics seem to surface with regularity. There's always someone who has an opinion. <laughs> and they like to share it on Monday morning. <laughs> like to share it on Sunday night or Sunday afternoon. And share a little helpful hint or something you didn't get right. Or something you didn't make a decision on. You got the challenges of just the pressures of pastoring people and helping with their problems. You know, a pastor, that's his first name. You know, no one says call nurse. <laughs> Call policeman, call mayor, I say call pastor. Yeah. You know, when you have a baby born, call pastor. You know, Amen. someone dies, call pastor. Someone's taken the nursery room, call pastor. Someone can't pay their rent, call pastor. <laughs> you know, it's just what happens. It's pressure, but it's it's wonderful. It's rewarding. Amen. And uh, but uh, I thank God for those who've helped me through the years in my last twenty two years of attempting to be an extension of God's grace to his people. I'm glad for people who loved us and helped us and encouraged us. And I hope you're that way. If you're not a pastor, now help your pastor. Uh, don't complicate, compliment. Yes, sir. Encourage yes. and help them. The book of James is a unique book of the Bible, five chapters. You're familiar with it. How many would say, Pastor Wilkerson, I think uh, James might be one of my favorite books of the Bible. Anybody would say that? Someone calls it the Proverbs of the, of the New Testament. And you could tell that James, they, they, they believed that James and Jesus shared the same mother but had obvious different, different dads. James and Jude and Jesus probably grew up together. And it probably took him a while to accept that Jesus, his brother, was the Messiah. He might have had some bitterness because his mom and dad would say, why can't you just be like Jesus? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Took him a while to figure it out, but he... He went on, and after the first pastor of the church of Jerusalem, looks like James, the, the apostle, passed away and was killed by Herod. And Peter had to go to other locations to, to escape the sword after being broke loose from prison. 
It looks like James became the man who, who piloted and pastored that church in Jerusalem. A powerful church. A church with lots of problems, lots of persecutions. But God made him the pastor and he oversaw the council, I believe, in Acts chapter 15. And the Lord used him there. But it looks like to me that Jewish people who had come to know Christ were in a very discouraged and scattered place. They were now had dispersed to many places, not because of necessarily want, but because of persecution. And the Lord, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, inspires James to write a letter to the 12 tribes, Jewish Christians. And of course, when I got saved, everybody was happy. I was happy, everybody was happy. My mom was happy, my dad was happy, the church was happy. When I got baptized, equally, that was the case. That was not always the case for a Jewish believer, especially in the first century. When they would come home with wet hair, I'm sure you would have heard many arguments and maybe even beatings and divorce when a wife would come home and her husband would say, what's going on? What are you doing? Where have you been? Why is your hair wet? Don't tell me. You did that. You follow the people of the way and, oh, no. You could imagine widows who live with their kids and their grandkids and love them dearly but went to a preaching service and God wooed their heart to the Holy Spirit to believe and receive Jesus and they followed the Lord in baptism and came into the house of their kids or their son or their daughter and said, Mom, no, don't tell me you got baptized. You followed the, oh, Mom, we're not going to have someone influencing our kids that believes like that. We're Jews, we're Judaizers, that's another uh, sect, it's, it's, it's evil spoken up. What are you doing? Oh, honey, I can't tell you the joy that has come to my heart, and I know there's forgiveness of sins in, in Christ. He said, well, you, you need to pack your bags. As far as you, you'll see your kids for the last time. These grandkids are never going to be around someone like you. And, of course, the church began to pick up all the pieces of, of broken and frazzled. I no doubt people went to work on a Monday after the news got out that they had followed the Lord in, blab, in baptism and followed the Lord in, in salvation. And they got, the boss came, hey, hey, is it true? What? What, sir? Yeah, you got a glow about you, but is it true? You accepted the Lord? You got saved? You accepted this, this uh, pseudo-Messiah? Oh, man, it's, it's the most wonderful thing ever happened. Well, that's wonderful, but you're not working here. <laughs> you can go work someplace else. All kinds of challenges was taking place, and they were probably questioning their mind like the writer of Hebrews tries to chair with the Hebrew Christians that Christ is better. Whatever you have to give up, Christ is better. But for James, I think he gives a little different slant. James, I think he comes to them and he says, look guys, it's time to put your big boy britches on. It's time to mature. It's time to get strong and, and to grow up. He uses the word perfect several times in the book of James. Growing up, maturing. I don't know about you, but nothing would quite aggravate me as a young man and even as an older man when someone said, why don't you just grow up? I'd be like, hey, you know. Or someone would say, oh, John, you're so immature. I said, no, I'm not either. Hey, hey, man, well, don't, don't say that. <laughs> I hate it when someone makes me, but you know the truth of the matter is, immature people sap the life out of an institution. Naturally, we want to grow. Want to mature. But you know, spiritual mature Christians are very important to the work of God. At the same time, immature babies, and some of them are pastors like me and, and pastors' wives, and we can have immature moments. But to grow spiritually, I think that is the goal of James as he looks and thinks about his brothers who are scattered abroad, and he gives them a quick greeting, and he quickly says, hey, we got to grow up. We got, to, we got to learn to work through this situation. And I think he strategically gives 12 things from, Gen, from, from uh, James 1 to James 5 in the end, things that people can do that they will show maturity and help them grow in maturity. I want to be that kind of a Christian. I'd like to be a mature Christian. Sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not. I don't know exactly what a mature Christian lo looks like, but I would say a mature Christian, number one, they know themselves. They know their strengths, their weaknesses. They're, they're familiar with, with where they are. If they got a sharp temper or a, quick, a short fuse, they know it. If they know that they can't handle certain things, they, they don't watch it. 
I've got a friend of mine who says, you know, I have a spiritual gift. I said, wonderful, everybody does. He said, what's your spiritual gift? He said, criticism. <laughs> I said, now hang on a second. That's not in the Bible, brother. He goes, I know, but it's my problem. He goes, I got something critical to say about everything. He goes, I just look at something I have. Huh, that's not straight. That's not right. He goes, I got to really get a rein in on that. But really, my friend is mature. He's, a, he's acknowledging I got a weakness. I know myself. Mature Christians not only know themselves, they are themselves. They're, they are themselves on Monday is what they were on Sunday. What they are in the workplace, I mean, they might have different clothes on, but they're going to be pretty even. They're going to be genuine and people of integrity and people you can trust. Because mature Christians not only know themselves, they are themselves. I think mature Christians are, are careful about other people's feelings. They're sensitive to the needs of others. All of us ought to be that way. We ought to be sensitive. Every once in a while, I say, I don't care what anybody says. I just I say what I want. What I, you're a baby. <laughs> Only babies say what, you're fat, you know, or whatever, you know. That's, we understand when a two-year-old says that. I don't understand it when everybody else says, I don't care, I don't care who I offend. You're a baby. The more mature I become, the more careful I am. The Bible says, look, not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. He said, I want you to, to comfort the feeble mind, to support the weak, be patient with all men. Mature Christians learn to say, you know what, it's not about me. You that are strong in the faith, receive the weak. And not to please yourself. God reminds us that mature people certainly know themselves. They are themselves. They're, they're, they're considerate of other people's feelings, other people's situations. I think mature people have a contented spirit. They have a spirit that, that recognizes that uh, it's not about me. God has given me everything I need to be happy right now. Have you ever taken a trip with a discontented person? You know, you, 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 stop, you stop on, uh, you know, to get something to eat. Oh, McDonald's again. Oh, man. Wish you could have gone to Taco Bell. You know, just <laughs> that person. you know, like, ha, ha, ha. While you're riding down the road, you know, there's like, hey, you ever hear of AC? Huh, you know, and, then, you know, you turn the A.C. on, five minutes later, we're we trying to hang meat back here, it's freezing now. You know, you just, you kind of want to drop them off at the rest area and tell them, be careful crossing the street, we'll pick you up on the way back. <laughs> oh, it's frustrating. Mature people, they'll have a contented spirit. Mature people, I think, are focused on responsibilities, not rights and privileges. They're not thinking what's comfortable, what's easy, what's convenient, what's popular, what is right. Nothing's ever settled till it's settled right. Never it's ever settled right till it's settled right with God. I think if there's one thing the Bible teaches us is righteousness. What is right? I think mature people are focused on the eternal, not just the temporal. They're not just thinking about the next 30 years, thinking about the next 30 million years. They're following the, the advice of our Lord Jesus Christ to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. They're thinking about the eternal. I think mature people are motivated by love. I think of James was trying to say, listen, it's time to mature. It's time to grow up. Boy, your, your kids would have a much better dad if they had a mature dad, spiritually mature. Our church would have much better pastors if their pastor was spiritually mature, not a baby. Our, mother, our, our kids have much better mothers. and Our, our, our siblings have much better siblings. Our ministries have much better leaders and participants if we had some maturity. Well, I think James, he really bangs away at this. And I don't want to take a long time, but I will just tell you, I think if you big at chapter 2, he'll say, look, if you show maturity, you'll have to understand who the Lord of glory is and you'll have to learn to treat people right, not be a respecter of persons. Spiritually mature people are, are not a respecter of persons. Mature people get with it. They have faith, but they show their faith by their works. They're servants. You know, they, you, you oftentimes hear people and, and they just, they, just uh, they, 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 they become armchair quarterbacks. But they're not involved. They're not serving. They're not helping other people. And may God help us to be servants. Servants. Find something to do for the Lord. Chapter 3 says mature people learn to govern their tongue. And our tongue is meant to direct like a bit directs a horse or a helm directs a a, a, a ship. 
It's made to direct people and to help them and to provoke them to love and good works and to compliment, to encourage, not like a fire to destroy. I think spiritually mature Christians in chapter 3 learn to seek spiritual wisdom. Wisdom is from above, which would be first pure and peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, full of good works, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Chapter 4, he says, I think spiritual mature people learn to submit to God and resist the devil and draw nigh to God because those things keep us from having contentions from whence come wars and fightings among you, come to not hence from your own lust. Submissive people learn to ask God for help. You have not because ye. Submissive people learn to let their motives come in check with God. Submissive people are not worldly. In the same context, the Bible tells us that, that uh, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. I think I'm, I submit to you that many people are worldly because they're naturally rebellious. They are not willing to submit to God. They, 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 they love this world and they're not willing to submit and yield on music or yield in, in areas that they want to have or entertainment or, or things of that nature. They, they're not submissive to God. They're not drawing nigh to God because when you draw nigh to God, you hate things that He hates. Things that are counterproductive to Him. He reminds us of those things in chapter 4. Anyone who's spiritually mature understands that life is short. It's like a vapor that appears for a little time, vanisheth away, the brevity of life. Chapter 5, he says, spiritual mature people understand that your substance is going to be evaluated. It's where he says, you rich men weep and howl for the misery that's going to come upon you. Why? Because you saved too much. You didn't know when enough was enough. Your clothes are moth-eaten because you, they just stayed there and you haven't put them in matriculation. Your gold and silver has, has cankered under your watch. You've kept it in bags and just watched it turn green rather, rather than invest it for eternal purposes. Amen. It's caused you to be cruel and unjust with those who work for you. and It, it causes us to live in luxury and like a, a cow that gets fatted just to be slaughtered. And then he says mature people are steadfast through difficult times. They continue to be faithful like, like a, a, a farmer who waits for the early and the latter rain. And the last two attributes of spiritual mature people in chapter 5 of James is that they are prayer warriors. They understand that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. They learn to pray. They learn to trust God. And he used the example of Elijah who was a man whose subject like passions like we are yet without he, 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 he believed God and he asked God and God answered his prayer. And then it ends up with soul winning and helping a brother err from his way and you recover a brother from his sin. You'll not only, you know, cover a multitude of sins, but you'll, you'll help somebody. You know, I think about all the, the, the things that soul winning does. But one of the best things that soul winning does is that it, it takes people who are drunks that beat their wives and, and are all, it takes that, it takes, it changes that. It keeps other people around them from experiencing a multitude of sins. It gives children a hope and help when someone's a soul winner. But in the first part of James, James says, after he gives a quick greeting to the 12 tribes scattered, greeting, how you doing? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. I don't know about you, but that's not the first thing. Joy is not the first thing that comes to my mind when I come into a diverse problem. I don't know about you. I don't know. I, I don't like problems. I may be allergic to them. <laughs> Wherever they are, I want to be somewhere else. But the truth of the matter is, problems are a reality in a fallen world. And he says, whenever you fall into a diverse, different kind of problem, count it all joy. Not for the problem, but for what God will do through the problem. I think as we learn to mature as Christians, we have to anticipate problems. You can fight them off if you want to, but the truth of the matter is I think it's better off that we embrace our problems with the wisdom of God. You know, the first thing you have a problem is I want you to praise me for it. I want you to thank me for it. I want you to count it a joyful thing. Because problems and diverse problems bring a patience. 
And that's strength to keep going. That's strength to take another problem. And learning how to do that. The first thing he tells the, the people there is, number one, when you have a problem, thank God for your problem. Praise him for what he's doing through it. Number two, in verse number five, you're very familiar. I think if I start it, we can all say it together. Most of us could say it. If any man lack wisdom, let him who give it to all men and upbraideth, and it shall be given him. And the second thing we do in problems is pray. Now, problems oftentimes cause us to have, have prayer and to pray. Your theme of the year, for all things for your sake. At the time that Apostle Paul wrote that, he was in the problems. Matter of fact, he said, I was cast down, but I wasn't cast out. He goes, I was really stressed, but I, wasn't, I didn't give up. I was perplexed, but I kept going. He, was tell, he said, this was, it was a tough time. He said, but all things I was going through are for your sakes. That God's abundant grace, you know, problems cause us to do they cause us to humble ourselves and to ask God for help and the thing I need in problems and you need in problems and spiritual mature people get this when I have a problem I got to quit getting out there on Facebook and giving everybody my stuff okay and then get out quit quit just complaining and find the next phone who, who can I phone a friend <laughs> it's so hard being me no that's not what you do when you have a problem you can say okay God Thank you that there's a reason. Because problems come for seasons and they come for reasons. No one has a breakneck problem their whole life. Every day is a horrible day. Most of our memories are good memories. Most of our days are good days. But problems are going to come and they come in seasons and they come for reasons. And they need, number one, to mature Christians will say, Lord, I thank you for this problem and for what you're going to do through this difficulty. Number two, I'm going to pray for wisdom in this problem. I think it's interesting. Probably the, the man who gave the most, had the worst day outside the Lord Jesus Christ was Job. Job went from having riches to rags, having a house full of ten kids to, I, 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 I remember just uh, planning a funeral for one of my children. It was, it was unbelievably hurtful and painful. Could you imagine 10 caskets in a church? Finding 10, 10 places to lay your kids. Could you I, I remember laying with Linda so many nights and I just hear her cry and I didn't know what to do for her. She'd just bawl as she would fall asleep thinking about our 17-year-old son that went home to be with the Lord. I could not imagine being Mr. Job's, husband, or Job's wife and the hurt she was going through. But he had lost relational things, financial things. He started, he felt good. And then he felt terrible. From the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, pain, intense pain, boils all over him. Chronically so. And his wife is hurting. She doesn't know what to do. But the Bible says in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God how? He wasn't foolish. He wasn't foolish. The opposite of wisdom is foolish. He, he learned to see things. I don't know what all wisdom is. I know Jesus is the personification of wisdom. I know Proverbs is the book of wisdom. But practically speaking, wisdom is like seeing life through God's lenses. When I look at my Bible, it's very blurry. I can't see it. I couldn't read it without my glasses. But I can put my glasses on and I can see clearly what it says. And there's a lot of things in life I don't understand. And I think we ought to be okay with that. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts and our thoughts. A lot of things I look at and I say, I don't get it. I don't understand this. Why did this happen? And why is it so hard? When they can get 75,000 people to pile into a stadium and pay an ungodly amount of money to watch their team lose. And I'm having an act of Congress to get 75 people to sit still for a Sunday morning free service. <laughs> what is going on? Why is this so difficult? I don't understand it. But here's what I do know. There's a God in heaven. Why difficult things happen? I don't understand all that. But I need to say, God, would you give me your wisdom? Would you let me see it through your lenses? Would you help me see what your purposes are? how your power will be manifested, how your performances are going to take place 
in this situation. Mature Christians, I think they find real hope in knowing that when I have a problem, I can praise God for the problem. I can pray for wisdom in the middle of the problem. And then verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. I can persevere through it. And Christian, I don't know where you are, what your situation is, but uh, problems are universal. Someone said if all of our problems were hung out on the line, at the end of the day you'd pick your problem and I'd pick mine. We all got it. One of the greatest things you can do through difficult times is to thank God for what He's going to do in your life. I remember playing basketball years ago and the coach would make us do calisthenics and run wind sprints and suicides, that we called them. And he would say that classic line, you know what it is, no pain. No pain. I'd say, coach, no pain? No pain. <laughs> He'd say, get back on the line, Wilkerson. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, trials bring about praise and purposes. So I need God's wisdom and I need to keep on going. The old poem says, when things go wrong, they sometimes will. When your road you're trudging seems all uphill. When the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile. But you have to sigh. When prayer presses you down a bit, care presses you down a bit. Rest if you must, but don't you quit. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And we can never tell how close we are. Success may be near to us, though we think it's so far. So Stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things go wrong that you mustn't quit. When we have problems, they're there to mature, to grow us as we praise, as we pray, and as we persevere. Would you mind saying that with me? As we praise, as we pray, as we persevere. Our Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for people who are living this truth out in far more challenging circumstances than many of us would do. Thank you for the example of those who, who look at a problem and say, Lord, I know you're doing something. I'll trust you. Please give me wisdom to know how to handle it, what to do, and know that you're not going to upbraid us. You're not going to be challenged by that. And then, Lord, that we can keep on going. Blesses a man that endureth temptation, for when he's tried, there is a reward, there is a crown, there is a, a commendation from the God of heaven who saw everything from an aerial view. We love you, Lord. Please bless our brothers and sisters tonight. Keep working through the message of Brother Chapel. In Jesus' name, amen.